My name is Julie McCrossan, and it is my tremendous pleasure to welcome you to this latest community forum. We're talking about vaccine hesitancy, and we're hosted, of course, by Walper Jewish Hospital and Friends of Walper. In just a few moments, I'll introduce you to a, you know, a marvellous panel with a, a tremendous amount of erudition and experience on this topic. And of course, I will also explain to you how to ask questions. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Aboriginal land, the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And it also gives me pleasure to welcome our esteemed Dr. Alan Schell, a, a long to multi-year uh, uh, man connected with Wampa Jewish Hospital with these marvelous community forums and a, a working general practitioner. Over to you, Alan, to make us formally welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again, Julie, for being our very good host and moderator. And thank you to Walper Hospital for the last 18 years of giving the public uh, good non-fake information on health matters that keep you out of hospital. And certainly uh, when we developed this particular topic, we didn't think it would remain as a issue around vaccination hesitancy. Walper certainly is very well known for its uh, medical uh, palliative care and rehab medicine in the community. And tonight, I think we should all be aware that we're in difficult times with COVID and there are lots of questions that you've sent us and there'll be lots of answers to those questions, I think, in the body of tonight's presentation. So I think that we should uh, get on with three wonderful panellists that uh, we have put together for you tonight and uh, allow Julie to start the evening and for us to answer many of your questions. We expect about 250 people online tonight, which is fantastic. It is a very important uh, discussion that we're having tonight. So over to you, Julie, and thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. And uh, I just, before I begin, I'd love to welcome everybody who's watching us in Walper Hospital, because I know you're watching and a, a dear friend of mine, Jane, is a patient there. So a special hello to Jane. Well, as I said, welcome to this discussion about vaccine hesitancy. You can put your questions in now and all through until we finish at 9 p.m. on the dot. You can put questions through the Q&A. If you just click Q&A down there on the bottom, type in your questions. Dr. Alan Shell will be monitoring those questions all evening, as well as a long list that he has received in advance. And we will do our living best to get through as many of them as possible. Anonymous questions are welcome. We can't guarantee we'll do every question, but we're going to certainly try to cover all those topics. Um, and as I said, uh, just before nine o'clock, I'll throw back to Alan, who'll close proceedings and give us, give us a hint of what's coming in the next forum. Just before I bring my panel up, though, we've got a poll for you. So our, ma our mystery media man, Michael, will now put up the first of five poll questions. And I will give you, I'll shut up and just give you a few moments to answer the question. Have you had or do you intend to have your COVID-19 vaccination? Yes, no, not sure. If you could vote, please. And thank you, Michael. Let's have a look at our results to that question. So, golly, 69% of our audience so far have had it. Uh, eight people, 7% do not intend to have it. And 24% uh, are not sure. Thank you very much. If I could have our second poll question, please. Have recent reports of very rare side effects caused by the AstraZeneca vaccine, four to six cases per million doses, impacted on your decision to be vaccinated or not. So have the recent reports of very rare side effects caused by the AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca vaccine impacted on your decision about getting this vaccination for COVID? Yes or no? Could I have the answers, please? 54% uh, have said yes, 46% have said no. Our third question, please. Who is your most trusted source of information about COVID-19 
and the vaccine. Your GP, pharmacist, local government member, New South Wales government, federal government, news media, social media, friends and family. Who is your most trusted source of information? Thank you, the results please. So 51% the GP, 3% the pharmacist, none for local government, 14% New South Wales government, 10% federal, 9% news media, nothing for social media, 5% friends and family, 8% other. So the GP well and truly the major source. And our next one, please. When we open up our international borders, what do you think your risk of getting COVID-19 would be without the vaccine? Very low, low, neither high nor low, high, very high. Answers, please. Are very low. So I'll just say the question again. When we open up our international borders, what do you think your risk of getting COVID would be without the vaccine? So without the vaccine, 46% think it would be a high risk. 37% think it would be a very high risk. 13% say neither high nor low. And 3%, four people say there'd be a low risk and 1% or one person very low. Of course, my maths is poor, Michael. Can someone help me? Was that the last poll? Uh, yes, I think it is. Thank you very and... much. Thanks, Alan. Uh, that's why it's very important to have a doctor present who was good at maths, unlike myself. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome now our panel member and panel members. And I, if I could ask them all to turn on their uh, their cameras, please. I'll give you the full introduction to each person as I introduce them. But we have with us Professor Julie Leesk, Dr. Rob Menzies, and Professor Mary Louise McClaws. I'm going to start with Mary Louise, if I may. And Mary Louise McClaws is from the University of New South Wales. She's an epidemiologist with expertise in hospital infection and in outbreak management and in infectious diseases control. And uh, her many COVID related activities include being uh, on an expert advisory panel for the World Health Organization. But look, I think at this stage, Professor Mary, Lee, Marie, Mary Louise McClaws, you are what we call a COVID star. You are what we call overexposed in the media and we're grateful that you still come to Walper in the, all the circumstances. Look, just to begin, what is this vaccine hesitancy? What does it mean? Well, I actually think that uh, Julie Lesk is the best expert to answer that question because she's actually the social scientist and I'm just the epidemiologist. Uh, but for me as an outbreak manager, what it means is um, we worry that um, uh, people particularly over 70 are at risk of severe infection, hospitalization and death. And rather than get too gloomy, let me just remind you that sadly um, we had uh, 910 deaths uh, so far due to COVID and 98% of those deaths were in people over 60. When you take out those young ones from 60 um, to 69, 94% were 70 and over uh, that represent death. So they actually don't represent a very large group of infections. Uh, so that actually the 20 to 39 year olds represent 50% of all of our infections so far. But when it comes to hospitalization, when it comes to death, if you're over 70, uh, you are overrepresented in that risk. So vaccine hesitancy for me means I worry about our um, vulnerable in the community because we all know 
that sadly, as we get older, uh, we tend, our immune system uh, tends to sometimes let us down. That's why we have a special influenza shot each year that has an adjuvant to kickstart our immune system uh, and um, a vaccine for COVID-19 has the great likelihood of protecting you. Now, now, just to remind you that no vaccine protects you 100%, none. Um, so AstraZeneca has a very interesting level of protection. It's quite complex. Uh, there's a protection level for after one dose, after two doses and a couple of days, after two doses and they're three months apart and a couple of weeks. And then there's uh, the vaccine efficacy for um, asymptomatic or symptomatic infections. And then there's the efficacy for keeping you alive and not having severe infections. So let me just talk to that. It's about 80%, you know, 75, 80%, depending on which population we're looking at. Now that is really good news. But we need as many people as possible to take up the vaccine, to act like a barrier around those that are um, uh, uh, immune compromised, that just couldn't develop that immune response. So you may have the vaccine, but you just may not be lucky enough to be protected. And that's why the more of us that get vaccinated, the better we act like uh, a barrier. And, uh, and vaccination, I think, is one of the most uh, philanthropic act, acts that we can do, that we get a vaccine, not just for ourselves, but for everybody else. There's so, only, sorry. If I just, because uh, I, 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 I'll just get something from each of our panel, yes. but I mean, I, the guts of what I'm hearing from you is that you just think getting vaccinated is rational and protective for the individual, particularly if you're over 70, but it's also a, almost a civic duty is what you're saying. It's something you do for your whole community. Is that what you're That's right. But I'd also like to say that I'm just not going to pick on the elderly. I really would like the 20 to 39 year olds, particularly that represent, um, you know, 50% of the cases because of that, they then represent a big uh, risk for transmitting it because they're young, um, they're sociable, they have about at least 10 social interactions every day. That's why contact tracing is so difficult because they are so sociable. So we need particularly that group and particularly the elderly. Am I the only person on tonight who doesn't consider someone over 70 elderly? <laughs> I'm 67 in October, but anyway, Julie can- I'll, I'll say mature, Julie. mature. Mature. Um, 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 Julie Leesk, if I could introduce you and ask you to give us a definition of a vaccine hesitancy. Uh, Mary Louise has indicated she feels you're the best person to do so, but Professor Julie Leesk is the Susan Wakel School of Nursing and Midwifery Professor in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney, also an advisor to the World Health Organization, uh, a fellow in the National Center for Immunization, Research and Surveillance, I think a visiting fellow and also you've been listed in the 100 uh, most influential people in the uh, Australian Financial Review, which is you know, always tremendous. So if you could pop your mic on and, and just tell us this word vaccine hesitancy, suddenly it's in the media, but I feel I only heard it for the first time about two weeks ago, but you've probably heard it for years, haven't you? What is it? Yeah, I have heard it for years, Julie. Thanks for the introduction. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on Darug land and um, pay my respects to elders past, present and future. So vaccine hesitancy is a motivational state of being conflicted or opposed to vaccination. And a motivational state means that it's a state of mind. It's a, a state of um, intention. It's not a behaviour, so it's not actually refusing a vaccine. Um, and in fact, there are plenty of people who refuse vaccines who are not that hesitant at all. So hesitant people uh, tend to be people like all of us. We care about our health. We want to do the right thing. Um, and we want to understand more about vaccines, these things that go in our bodies, that work with our bodies. And uh, hesitancy is 
something that um, is very normal, particularly when there's a new vaccine on offer and uh, science is still learning more about that vaccine's effectiveness and safety. And, uh, you know, your poll we saw earlier, I'd put the people who said they were unsure about whether to get a COVID vaccine as being the people who are hesitant. Some of you who have said, no, I won't get one might also be hesitant. You've got a lot of questions and concerns perhaps. And uh, that was, I think, 24%, not that different from the general population at the moment, which is around 23%. So, um, hesitancy is not when people face barriers to getting vaccination because of supply or distribution issues, because of program confusion or because of health professional told them not to. So there are a lot of other reasons why people don't vaccinate. And Julie, do we have a problem with vaccine hesitancy in Australia today? I mean, is this an issue we should be worried about? Given what Mary Louise has said, that it is a, a civic duty to have the vaccination, whatever our age, and life-saving if you're older. Hesitancy is only a problem if it becomes the behaviour of refusing a vaccine that's safe and effective. So the, the vaccines offered to children on the national and adults and teenagers on the National Immunisation Program are, um, are all well tested. They're um, very safe and effective, although, of course, all vaccines will come with minor side effects and rare serious side effects as well. So uh, hesitancy itself is not something we should be worried about. But when it means that a whole lot of people reject a vaccine that we really need them to have, then it becomes a problem. So it's when it turns into that behaviour of delaying or stopping vaccinating. And can I just ask you, 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 you believe that you, you, you think of vaccine hesitancy as a, on a spectrum. Can you explain what you mean by that spectrum and its significance? Yeah. So we often think of um, vaccination as, as having people who are for it or against it. But it's, it's a little more complex than that. So at one end of the spectrum are the people who are wanting the vaccine right now. They'll queue up. They'll be calling the GP. They want that COVID vaccine um, and I'd call them the, the people who are uh, advocates or they're demanding the vaccine now. Then there are people who will just go along with it and accept vaccination without thinking too much about it. Then there are people who are hesitant, as we've just talked about. And then there are the people who will refuse some or all vaccines for themselves or their children. And then there are the people who are anti-vaccination activists. And being um, not wanting to get the vac a vaccine is not the same as being an anti-vaxxer. I try to reserve that term, which is quite a, a loaded kind of term for people who are active keyboard warriors, day and night campaigning against vaccination. So that's that spectrum. Could I just ask a personal question that I'm interested in, and then I want to hear a little bit from Rob, and then we'll go to Alan for our first questions. But Given what Mary Louise has said about the importance in a sort of prevention of hospitalisation or even prevention of death of getting the vaccination if you're over 70, and a lot of our audience watching tonight, a significant proportion will be over 70 based on earlier polls we've done. If there's a member of your community or someone you love and care about who's saying, I'm not going to get it. I, I don't feel yet I've got enough information. Um, so they're not, as you say, they're on the spectrum of hesitancy, but they're delaying it. Um, and if a member of your family is worried about that, how can you best approach that? You know, is there any evidence or understanding we have about how we, we don't want to reinforce hesitancy by being too pushy with someone or what would be your general advice? Yeah, it's a great question, Julie. And that pushiness is called the backfire effect. You, you push someone into a corner and they just become more firm in their views. So when someone's expressing those concerns and if, you know, they're, they're um, in a, a, an age group that is older, then we'd really love to see them vaccinated against COVID because they're at much higher risk from hospitalisation, getting very sick or dying from COVID um, than younger age groups. 
So in that case, um, you kind of want to mentally set your goal. And to do that, you want to know where they're at. So first of all, if someone's really dead set against vaccination, choose your battles, but certainly make an effort to be curious and understand where they're coming from. And once you've done that and heard them and, and ask them, well, so what are your concerns about it? Um, and then you're in a much better position to um, maybe advise them or help them seek information or give them information you have. Um, and certainly acknowledging them and where they're coming from is so important. So that listening factor is so valuable. And then maybe helping them find information, letting them know what you're planning and maybe even letting them know what you'd like them to do. So if it was my mum or my aunt who was, you know, very, very unsure about vaccinating, I'd say I'd have that conversation and then I'd say I'd, I'd like I'd like you to be I'd like you to be vaccinated. I understand that there is a choice to be made, and you want to find out more about the risks and the benefits. But um, I just want you to know that I want you to be vaccinated. Thank you so much. It's a, a gentleness and a respect, and uh, we will hear more from each of our panel members uh, about uh, good websites to go to to get the sort of balanced and evidence based information that allows someone who wants to learn more. Uh, to get uh, good quality information. But if I could just welcome Dr. Rob Menzies, who's also an epidemiologist, a visiting fellow at the University of New South Wales Faculty of Medicine, a long public sector career, uh, and now working for a vaccine manufacturer, uh, Thanofi. Rob, uh, my understanding is that one key point that you wanted to raise tonight is that there is a very, um, thorough approval process before a vaccine is able to be used in, in, in the public to the with the public can you just speak to that what what is your message there yes thank you julie uh greetings from the dark side by the way from uh, pharmaceutical company land um yes i i think um if people understood uh or appreciated the the amount of testing uh, that goes into the, that whole process of, of developing a vaccine and determining that it's safe um, and effective. And then the review, so we're talking for the a typical uh, new, new vaccine, such as one of the COVID vaccines um, around uh, 15,000 people would have been vaccinated as part of those clinical trials and monitored very closely to for, for adverse events um, as well as effectiveness and and there are several stages in that in that process so you start with a very small number of of recipients to to make sure there's nothing nasty going on uh, and then you do it the next stage is a slightly larger study and 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 then when you're fairly confident that uh you've got something that works and um, there are no serious alarm bells, then you give it to a large number of such as, you know, 15,000 people in a trial. Um, and then that information is reviewed by um, registration bodies such as the, the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia and, um, and also in the case of vaccines, the technical group, uh, Australian Technical Group on Immunisation Advisory Group, sorry, ATAGI. Um, and these are all experts uh, whose remit it is to ensure that nothing gets through that is unsafe, because uh, we all, uh, us sort of in the, in the field, understand that if something does sneak through, such as um, febrile convulsions uh, in uh, young children due to flu vaccine in 2010, it's a disaster. And in in Western Australia, uh, the coverage rates in a, a flu vaccine in children has still not recovered from that 10 years later. Uh, and Rob, it, can I just say to you, because uh, I know some people will be thinking, well, look, there's been some media commentary is because of the extraordinary scale of, of, uh, of illness and death and the fear of overpowering and overwhelming our health system. And we're seeing this appalling suffering 
appalling suffering in India at the moment and elsewhere, Brazil, that there's a, you hear commentary, has it been done too quickly this time? Just in a nutshell, what would you say to that? Uh, the short answer is is no, and um, the reason is all the the usual processes have been gone through, but they're done in this time. They were done in parallel rather than in series, if that makes sense. So what you had is a lot of large pharmaceutical companies were actually funded. Uh, over the past five years or more, billions of dollars by the EU and uh, the United States to prepare their systems um, for, and, and to in fact pre-purchase vaccines um, in the case of a, of a pandemic. So they, they were funded to, to do these trials in parallel it, so, so that they didn't have to wait to get the results of the first one before they started the second one. And in fact, they're actually manufacturing doses of vaccine by the millions before they know that it works. And if the trial ends up being uh, having unsu being unsuccessful, then those vaccines all go in the bin. Um, but you know, I just, I, I'm just going to get a quick comment from Mary Louise because she has a meerkat look about her, an alertness. Can I, if you could pop your mic on, what are you thinking, Mary Louise, as you listen to Rob? Is there a comment you want to make? Uh, um, so uh, everything Rob is saying, I concur with. I mean, I'm on a WHO, a couple of WHO committees, and last night we were very fortunate to have the world expert vaccinologists update us. And, and they remind us to remind everybody that there were also tens of thousands of volunteers. And Rob will tell you, he's the expert in this, that uh, that takes years to enrol people, years. But there were so many people that were suffering that could see the suffering in Brazil, um, in the US, many other places, that they put their arms out. So um, the reason that we've got results so fast, no corner was cut. It was that they had many, many uh, volunteers so rapidly. And, um, and also at WHO, they have a, a panel of experts that not only look at the uh, um, quality of the vaccine, they look at all the safety uh, regulations as well. So it's usually got to go through the country regulator and then it goes through um, uh, what's it called, the WHO emergency use listing um, process as well. It's very, very rigorous. Look, thank you so much, team, and uh, welcome if you've just joined us. We're talking about vaccine hesitancy with our panel. And if you want to ask a question, just pop it in the Q&A. Alan, a first question, please, and for our panel, and I might direct it to the person who seems most appropriate. Uh, the, the, the top questions are to do with I've had a clot or my family members had a clot or I've had a stroke and should I have then the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine? And the second one I think we should ask maybe Julie is um, the efficacy of the two that we do have, AstraZeneca and Pfizer, before we go to Moderna or even any of the other vaccines. So I think two things are most, the, the big questions are- I've Let's had, do one at a time. So the first one? Is on, I've had a previous clot or some in my family has had a clot and we're talking about both below 50 and over 50. And should I then be concerned is the question. And then how effective are the vaccines? Thank you so much. Rob, do you wanna go first? Yes, I'd say um, go to your GP and discuss it with them. Um, we have experts uh, to, to assess the, the medical risks and, and the evidence. And uh, the burden is not on each individual to, to weigh up that evidence. Um, so uh, GPs are getting information flows from the government all the time. So go and talk to your GP. Julie. Can I, of course, can I just say, Julie, that we had a 51% a top rating for GPs for their, the, the question we had, who was most trusted in providing information. So I agree with Rob. You should go and individual issues, please go and talk to your GP. Thanks, Alan. But as a general practitioner, we're expecting you to be keen on that, Jeremy. No, that was a joke, that was a joke. Uh, Julie Leesk, what were you wanting to say there, please? 
I agree. Um, you should talk to your doctor about this, but the advice currently that's given to GPs by the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation is that there's no particular known risk factors from the people who have gotten the clots so far, um, except age. So the younger you are, the more at risk you are from the epidemiology of the clotting. However, um, it is recommended that if you have a history of two, a couple of particular types of clotting, um, heparin-induced thr thrombocytopenia and CVST, the cerebral clots, that you don't have the vaccine. But if you have a history of the regular sort of deep, deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolus, the clot, the lung clot, then um, there's no evidence at this stage that you're more at risk from clotting again. So again, it's very important that you check with your GP and don't assume that just because you've had clots before, you can't have the vaccine. You may be able to, to have the AstraZeneca vaccine. Thank you. Mary Louise, your, just your comment on this question of the, the risk of clotting and, and what your message is there. Mm. Uh, so last night at the WHO meeting, they were talking about uh, thrombos thrombocytopenia syndrome. And it's a, it's a very new condition. And they're not sure whether it's um, some sort of genetic uh, response. Certainly, it's related to platelets, the little things that actually uh, clump deliberately to stop us from bleeding out when we scratch ourselves um, and um, it really although it seems like a lot of people have had it it's still very rare around the world compared to the number of people that have died from uh, COVID around the world and and don't forget uh, we've sent a very bad message that says right at the beginning so there wasn't any uh, I believe in telling real truth to people and then help them cope with the with the knowledge I don't like softening the blow necessarily and I think that often the authorities initially started using the term mild COVID no it's, it's you ask a survivor and they're going to say that wasn't mild it took six weeks to get over so I think we should term it non-hospitalized COVID um, it, the the non-hospitalized COVID uh, has a lower risk of what we call long COVID, which is where you suffer uh, very um, uh, all sorts of conditions, but particularly cardiovascular conditions for more than 12 weeks, have unpredictable fatigue. Um, and, and you can have all sorts of complications with kidneys, etc. cetera. Uh, it's very difficult to work out who's going to get it, but certainly uh, if you've had severe COVID, uh, you're probably uh, at, a, at a higher risk of long COVID. So, and, you know, and as I've mentioned, 98% of cases of death, um, and of course, most of the cases being admitted to hospital were in the elderly. So your GP will help you decide what your risk of COVID is. If you're at all concerned about the blood clots and Julie's uh, very neatly gone over all of those issues. Uh, but your GP will help you to work out um, what is good for you. And, and bottom line, if I could just say to someone who fronted up, I've still got the little Band-Aid on from my vaccination with AstraZeneca yesterday, is it's unbelievably rare. To be honest with you, Julie, my, if I could put a question to you and then we'll come to Alan's second question. What I struggle to cope with, or to, no, that's the wrong word. I struggle to understand is how you could look at what's happening in places like Britain, the United States, let alone India and Brazil, and not think, my God, this thing is so deadly. I need a protective vaccine. And this extremely rare complication, it's just so rare it's not worth thinking about. So can you help me understand the, the thinking of people? I'm coming to you because aren't you a sociologist? Uh, I'm actually a nurse with training in public health and most of my research is on vaccine uptake and why people don't vaccinate. Um, but I've learned a lot about vaccination along the way and Rob and I used to work together at the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance. So um, the reason that people are hesitant in Australia now in the face of these stories about the clots is that yes, they're rare, 
But sometimes something that's very, very serious, which this TTS, um, rare clotting syndrome is, then people will be concerned about it because they're taking an action that could bring that outcome. Whereas right now in Australia, we have very, you know, we've got a case in New South Wales now, which reminds us that COVID can get in, um, but we have very little COVID. And so if we were to make a decision based on the risks right now, then the balance for those under 50, or even with a small outbreak, would be that the risks from clotting are higher than the risks from get, going to ICU with um, COVID. However, if we all make that decision, then in future we could face, um, we will face vulnerability to COVID as a nation, as, as communities we will. Um, so we need to, when we're thinking about these decisions, think about the risks and benefits now, but think about our future and also our contribution to protecting others because we don't know how much the vaccines will reduce transmission, but they will to some degree. So having a vaccine will help reduce our chance of spreading COVID to others. And it will also help us as a nation be able to be more open and friendly, open our borders to be able to see family overseas. So there are a lot of reasons to vaccinate, but people need to make an informed decision based on good quality sources. Well, thank you so much. Uh, 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 if you turn on your mic very quickly, Mary Louise, because I want to come yes, to the second yeah. question. Uh, well, it's to do with the second question really, and that is how effective is it? So can I just remind uh, the, you know, the, the, the listeners that um, the UK has used AstraZeneca and um, uh, they're now at a coverage rate of 75 per 100 people have had at least one dose. Uh, when they started, uh, they had 18,400 odd cases on a daily basis. Now they started in December and it's been about 137 days since they've rolled out. Then now on a really bad day, just recently they had 67,000 cases. Um, but um, they've, uh, they, uh, when they had a peak, however, uh, they've had a 7.5 fold decrease in caseload because of AstraZeneca. And then compared to the peak, uh, when they had this really nasty outbreak, um, they've had a 28 fold decrease. So it does work. And I know that there are many questions about, um, will I be prevented from passing it on? And that's quite complex. The, the trial um, data suggests one thing only, and that's because um, it was too expensive to look at viral load. However, the logic is, if you're protected from severe COVID, then you'll be protected because your viral load is low from if you do acquire it, your viral load will be much lower and you'll have less risk of passing it on. You may still be able to pass it on if you're asymptomatic. So there's about 17% of people right now who can be asymptomatic and pass it on, but they've got about a 50% drop in their ability to pass it on. They still can. Uh, that's the true asymptomatics, not those that are pre-symptomatic. So my point is, is that um, when we start to uptaking it in large numbers, and if we're to open the border, and if we had a, a third wave, you would see much fewer people acquire it, have, having severe infections and passing it on, I believe. Rob, can I ask you a quick question and then I'll come back to Alan. Mm -hmm. It just strikes me, one of the things I think you wanted to raise is that scepticism, which is common in relation to many authority figures in our society these days, is inappropriate if it's applied to our health leaders at the moment. Uh, that, that, that is, that's the nub of it. And I was just thinking, it's a challenging time for people, isn't it? Because it really is unfolding in real time. Now, I come from a family with both my brothers are doctors, my daughter's a doctor. And so I know that evidence-based people keeping up with the latest research 
are making clinical and intellectual judgments all the time. And I trust that the Mary Louises and the Julie Leasks and the Rob Menzies and all our health officers are doing the best they can to be across all the evidence and give us the best advice today. But it is a fluid scene. So what's your basic message around trust for people who are in that group at the beginning of our poll, who are feeling a bit on the spectrum of hesitancy? Um, yes, um, so I think the whole COVID experience is uh, showing, providing a, a, a reminder to people how we are, a, community and um, we need our public services. Uh, we need government and government has a, a, a very important role to play. Um, and uh, yes, I, I mean, it's just my sense that, that people um, do, uh, you do need scepticism in everyday life. Um, you need to make judgments all the time. And, you know, we watch politicians on, on TV um, or, or wherever, and, uh, and, and there's marketing in, uh, messages coming across all the time. And uh, it's important for us to, to, to be alert and be analytical and, and try and work out um, what the angle is and and what I can believe and what I can't. Um, but I think for all of us panel members, we uh, have either served on government committees or or know many people who do. And and we know people work in public health because they want to improve people's health. Um, and uh, the amount of of effort that goes in uh, to uh, assessing the quality of, uh, of the interventions that we have um, is, is enormous. And, you know, I have uh, uh, enormous respect for the, those people who are making those judgments. And um, I think uh, people can be reassured that those messages are, can be relied on. That there isn't a, a, a hidden agenda going on um, it's so you know when people hear Paul Kelly speaking um, you can believe what he says uh, and uh, Thank you, I, might, so. I, might, I might come back to Alan Alan another question sir from you well it's all related to we have a choice in Australia of two vaccines AstraZeneca and Pfizer so one good question was I had the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine first should I now wait for the Pfizer to come on? I have that as the second. So I think that's a very simple one. But again, it comes to the efficacy of both vaccines or the ones that Moderna coming up. So I think for Julie, that was a question. And for Mary Louise to see, does WHO agree that it's AstraZeneca first and then wait for the Pfizer for their second shot? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's a very, mm -hmm. not a bad question from a lay person. It's a great question. Do you oh, want to sorry. go first? Mary Louise, and then I'll come to you, Julie, for comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so w at WHO, the, we were um, told a number of months ago uh, they haven't finished the trial yet in Oxford. Um, in fact, it's an Australian running it, actually. Um, and he's looking at the efficacy of having an AstraZeneca shot first and then a Pfizer, and then looking at Pfizer first and then an AstraZeneca. So at the moment, we're told we shouldn't be mixing our shots. Um, I believe that a lot of that advice is because they want to see what um, side effects are related to which shot and they want to keep it um, uh, all um, homogeneous. Uh, but um, it, I'm really looking forward to this, uh, these results of this mix and match because uh, the uh, messenger RNA, the Pfizer, is said to be able to be altered faster to uh, tweak against uh, variants of concern, which means that then we might be able to get a booster shot quite rapidly if there's any um, uh, impact on uh, the efficacy much faster. So if we can uh, mix and match well, that's a great, uh, a great uh, finding. How oh, interesting. Julie, would you comment please? So they're not licensed for the interchangeability 
uh, at the moment in Australia. Uh, that might change in time, but right now, if you've had your first dose of AstraZeneca vaccine, it's recommended that you have the second dose that will bring your immunity up to a higher level. You'll have better protection from COVID. And in terms of if you're concerned about the, the rare clotting disorder, um, the evidence so far seems to be that the risk is after a first dose. So if you're if you've been okay after the first dose, um, you are, are probably even more likely to be okay after the second dose. Now, things can change as we learn more about this, but at this stage, it appears to be a, a once-off thing. So if you've been okay with that first dose, you should be okay to go ahead. But again, talk to your GP, um, your specialist, um, well, your GP, I think I'd start with because they're being updated with this information and, and just get that information. But that's what we know at this stage. Can I just add to uh, what Julie has reminded um, everybody quite well that um, the uh, doing well with the second shot, uh, when you have Pfizer also, it appears that in fact you can do quite well with the first shot, but actually be um uh, have a response uh, that makes you very tired uh unwell but of course it's just a feeling of feeling nauseous and unwell um and i'm not talking about um clots but just a response a, a, a just a generalized response so the two respond very differently in the human body it's quite fascinating <laughs> rob did you want to comment on that issue uh well i I think I agree with, um, with Julie that um, it's not it, it's recommended at the moment to, to receive the two <coughs> shots of the same vaccine. Um, now, and, and the and the major reason for that is the lack of data on um, receiving mixing mixed schedules. Uh, there's probably nothing wrong with mixing the schedules, but we don't know that for sure. Okay, look, thank you. Alan, I'm inclined to keep getting audience questions if we could. If you have uh, another question, please. Yes, uh, again, um, comments that have come up that in having the first vaccination, how protected are we and then if we get the COVID as it happens now with a local, uh, somebody's concerned about local spread in the eastern suburbs, and then I've had my second one, and if I uh, pick up that COVID from this particular small cluster, uh, will I uh, then potentially be somebody passing it on? Uh, that, that is a big question, I think, for everybody, really. Yeah, so I, I gather this person went to Annandale, which is where I'm sitting at this moment. So Mary Louise, do you want to go first? I'll be listening intently. Yeah. Um, so if you've had uh, AstraZeneca, there's uh, three months between the first and the second shot. That's a long time. I don't assume uh, that you're at all covered. Uh, there are different levels of vaccine efficacy uh, looking at the different days. And in fact, that's how they found that if they waited for 30 days, that the vaccine efficacy was better than waiting for what they expected to be 21 or 28 days. Um, however, even after your second shot, uh, you're supposed to wait at least uh, 20 odd days. With the Pfizer, you're supposed to wait second shot plus 14 days, but the CDC in America say second shot, but tw um, 28 days, oh, sorry, 21 days. Um, so uh, we hear, of course, the uh, poor young man in the quarantine hotel had one uh, dose. I don't know which one it was with, um, but it just reminds you, uh, you still got to behave in a very uh, protective, safe COVID manner uh, between your shots. Um, but your antibody levels do start in increasing after a couple of weeks, uh, but don't take any risks. Yes, that's very interesting. Julie, would you comment on that, please? Um, I think uh, I think Mary Louise has has spoken enough about that. I mean, the concern is, will I? You know, I think Mary Louise. Some people would say, "Well, why bother vaccinating if it's not going to give me any, buy me any freedoms, or reduce my stress about passing it on?" And um, the answer to that is, it, it will help. Uh, and even 
two weeks after a first dose will give a little will give some um, percentage of immunity, but it will be small and it varies obviously with vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and what's the best is that you have those two doses spaced appropriately. So uh, it, it, it is going to help us when we get more and more people vaccinated and it will reduce the tendency for COVID to spread when we get really high coverage and it will um, lo very likely reduce our risk of transmitting COVID to other people. It's just that we don't know to what degree exactly just mm. yet. You know, Julie, I'm aware you need to go at 8.30, so I, I, I want to see if there's anything else you want to say. But first of all, as I listen to you, I've learned a lot already tonight, and I'm thinking, should I be wearing that mask and keeping 1.5 metres apart more? I, I, I You know... It, 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 I travel a lot within Australia, even at the moment, by car. And it's amazing the different behaviours that are happening in different cities. And uh, Sydney is known as being much more laissez-faire than some of the other cities. And in terms of what, if I'm understanding correctly, there are delays in the protection. The extent of the protection is still being truly understood. And then even after the second dose, there's still a bit more of a delay till the protection is up. So the key message is get vaccinated. It's good for yourself. It's good for your community, but it's not 100% everything's okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of what life looks like now and in the future, we'll continue to face risk and it, the risks will change. Um, I guess, you know, what's the advice for people about how they manage risk of COVID? Uh, it's know what the rules are and follow those because they're, they're put together by people in our state who or, or territory, wherever you are, who have a lot of knowledge and are taking great care and manage outbreaks as core business all the time. You know, they've managed them before COVID and they've done a great job with this. Um, so follow the advice know how the disease spreads and what are, what are the most effective behaviours. And, uh, and then we've just got to make, sometimes we've just got to make trade-offs. So if someone at a social event comes up to me and stands really close, do I say to them, oh, we should be distancing and create a socially awkward situation? Well, if there were a lot of if there, was, if there was established community transmission, I might do that. I might say, I'm worried about spreading COVID to you. I don't have it. If, if, I don't, if I have it and I don't know I have it, I'm concerned about you, I think we should stand apart more. But that's awkward. So there are all these sorts of trade-offs we make, but the most important things to think about are how vulnerable we are personally, um, whether there's COVID around in the community, and what our personal tolerance of risk is and what our risk to others is as well. One last comment, if I may ask you, as I know you're going to go shortly. As I understand it, one of the things that you were thinking of saying tonight is that if you are experiencing some degree of hesitancy, go to reliable sources. And I think you think the, uh, what is the most reliable website you'd recommend, Julie? So um, the Australian Government Department of Health actually has quite a lot of good information there. It take, can take a while to navigate to find it, but I think people should go there first, particularly because a lot of the information in Australia at the moment is centralised with the Federal Government Department. Um, and your state or territory might also have information for you. For example, where's your local, local vaccination centre or GP? And then the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance also has good information. Um, but I'd start with the Australian government. I've put in the chat a link to one of the resources that's available there. Just have a look around, browse and make it your business to learn from that website and also keep an eye on those Atagi, not Atari, not the game, <laughs> the Atagi updates because that's our, our preeminent advisory group who know stacks about vaccination. They're global experts 
and they are bringing very careful good advice to the government about how who should have vaccines which vaccines um, we should be having Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Because I know you're going to slip away shortly, something that hasn't been mentioned. Um, I'll just say, as I said earlier, that with this panel is on hesitancy, but hesitancy is not the only reason that people don't vaccinate uh, themselves or their children. And that there are a whole lot of other things like having convenient services or having um, knowing where to go and when when you're due for a vaccine. And remember that there are other vaccines that we as adults should be um, thinking about having if they're recommended for us, like the annual flu vaccine, and they're available now, like the pneumonia vaccine, like the um, Zoster or the shingles vaccine. So keep an eye out for all the vaccines that are recommended to you. And uh, if they're recommended, do very seriously consider having them. Well, thank you so much, Julie. And uh, I'd like to come back to Alan for another question from our audience, please. Um, Prime Minister Morrison recently talked about if you had the vaccine, you've created immune response, you travel and you come back, should we be having those people in a hotel quarantine or do we look at home quarantine until you've come back with a negative COVID test. Um, Rob or Mary Louise, who'd like to go first? Mary Louise, do you want to? Um, so eventually when we start opening up the borders, the quarantine hotel system's not going to be able to cope. Uh, there's going to be an enormous number of travellers, both um, Australians and visitors. So we're going to have to start um, giving also uh, uh, some um, a positive uh, response to being vaccinated. But a vaccine doesn't mean that you're always protected and that you can't possibly bring something home with you. Because you, as I mentioned, you might be one of those people who have never elicited an immune response. There is science around this, though, and um, there is a real reticent in Australia for using what's called rapid antigen tests. There are 12 of them that have been TGA approved, and in the first seven days of, of, um, of exposure, uh, they respond as well as the PCR test. Uh, WHO sends them out to low-income countries for diagnosis, but they are very good for screening. So the diagnosis test is different from screening. So you come in with a vaccine, a passport. Yes, you've been vaccinated, but you might still have a, uh, you might be pre-symptomatic. So if you had a rapid antigen test at uh, the airport and it said you're not carrying the virus. Now, at that stage, these tests are very good for repeat on the same group repeat. So they have to be repeated a couple of times. So then you might go to a low risk um, facility and be tested about uh, day uh, uh, two. And if you're still negative, uh, plus I'd suggest a rapid antibody test to make sure that you're not just vaccinated, but you've got good antibody response. Your rapid antigen test is negative, then you can go home because the, uh, the likelihood of you um, if you've been vaccinated plus good antibodies plus no antigen that you're carrying it is negligible. Um, so I, I do think we're going to have to start having some system. Now we could even, once we find that that works, we could then even um, say uh, if your family's been vaccinated at home because you don't want to go home and try to isolate in a family apartment without a separate bathroom. So you'd have to have your household vaccinated as well. They'd have to be willing to have your home. Um, and of course, you'd have to have that rapid test as on arrival. And we aren't using them yet. And um, there is a, there's a real reticence for it. Why? And uh, Why are they I don't know, but the prime minister has finally mentioned that he supports the idea of rapid antigen tests because he can obviously see that this is a way to open up much more safely and faster. So um, I think it's because 
uh, I mean, the Doherty Institute has tested some of these and found them to be at the same level of, of performance as a PCR test. You wouldn't allow any other rapid antigen test to be used. It had to, it would have to be that. And they take 15 minutes at a very most half an hour. By the time you get your luggage, you'll have your, uh, your, your uh, result. You go to a, a, to a facility or eventually you might be able to go home because and have a rapid antibody test as well. So I can see it loosening up and changing. Julie, what do you think of what's just been said? Because you're still here, so you might be thinking I'm going to comment. No, I was actually answering some of the questions on the Q&A, Julie, um, oh, I beg before you. I disappeared. Um, no, I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. No, thank you. So that's fine. Rob, do you think, what do you think of Mary Louise's prediction? Is that what's going to happen next? Oh, uh, well, yes. I mean, all these things, uh, these things are, will uh, need to be looked at. Um, I want what I thought I might add is that um, it will depend on things like what proportion of the population is vaccinated and, and how effective herd immunity turns out to be um, and these uh, types of um, uh, recommendations announcements will be made and they'll they'll change over time just as, as they have um, in the past with um, various control measures it may well depend on where people have come from uh, and what the situation was uh, in the countries they they were visiting um, so uh, it's it's going to be uh, uh, a movable feast. How long is this going to go on for, guys? Are we talking? I mean, is that just impossible to answer, Mary Louise? Or what is this five to ten years? The world's grappling with this. You need to turn on your mic. Well, looking at the, um, it, we've got nearly eight billion people on this planet. The correct thing we should have done as a, um, a wealthy country and all wealthy countries, uh, we should have, I mean, Australia has done remarkably well and it's because of the Australian people, they're just remarkably wonderful. Um, but the rest of the world, which had very poor leadership, such as the UK, the USA and, uh, and Europe for staying at home, doing what you're asked, wearing your mask when you're supposed to, not getting upset when the pub has to be closed. I mean, we just look at this and we're just gobsmacked. Imagine if we did all of that and the rich countries could then keep using public health and social measures well, then the vaccines could be sent to the low income and middle income countries that are overcrowded that just can't do those um, simple but basically first world uh, responses like social distancing, masks, et cetera, alcohol-based hand rub. It all sounds easy, but it can be very expensive. And then we would have a much uh, faster opening up of the rest of the world. But at this stage, I've calculated that at every, each country that's done well, um, Israel is an unusual group. So I've just looked at the UK and the USA for when they started taking off at uh, a great speed of uh, vaccination. It's about week eight or nine, they can start taking off very well. Now, I looked at that rate and I said, imagine if the rest of the world could vaccinate at that rate, how long would it take to vaccinate the rest of the world? Now, you can't vaccinate at the rate as, of the Americans in somewhere like Morocco or, or Africa, but imagine you could, it would take three years three years and that's without worrying about the production. So um, we aren't going to see the end of this anytime soon. We, I'm hoping that this will become a seasonal issue where we'll need our, um, our seasonal booster. Uh, so um, don't expect that life will return to normal anytime soon. Mary Louise, if I could just, oh yes, Julie, do you wanna come in? I, I just have to, um... I have to go, but just to say, I'm sorry, I have to go early. I have to uh, run a meeting that's helping countries to um, 
look at the drivers of um, vaccination for COVID-19 and help them look at ways to improve uptake. So there's great work happening through WHO and other agencies. And I just echo Mary Louise's comments about the importance of thinking beyond our borders and being generous with our vaccines um, now, not later. Uh, so East Timor, for example, uh, PNG, they really need vaccines now. It would make a huge difference to them. And there is good stuff happening um, with Australia and, and hopefully we'll continue to bring more vaccines to our neighbours. But um, there's, it's just so important that we think beyond our borders. And that can be hard sometimes with the news, <coughs> but we must do it if we're going to, as a world, control COVID well. Um, it's not just about us, it's about everybody. So thank you very much and sorry I have to leave early. Bye everyone. And, and thank, on behalf of everybody, thank you and thank you for answering questions individually as well. We really appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Julie. Uh, just before I come to you, Alan, I just want to ask Mary Louise one more question about what's likely to happen next because there must be people listening to the, what you've just said feeling really sad like I have a very close friend whose son's living in London and she hasn't seen him for ages there'll be people with family all over the world I mean is what you're saying that we may I mean when can we imagine safely traveling again or is that simply not possible to answer um no look I'm an optimist and I believe that um once we start um, see the issue of herd immunity is quite strange because each country has its own herd immunity and as Rob has talked about a, a lot of this is dependent on herd immunity but particularly when the borders are closed and if you get the occasional leak but when we start opening up our borders we really need global herd immunity but if you go to England it will have its own herd immunity and just to remind you I was just answering somebody's um, question about how it does well how does AstraZeneca do against um, variants of concern? And AstraZeneca is doing pretty well, um, uh, holding its own against the UK variant, not so well with um, the South African variant. And uh, uh, we really um, are still uh, waiting to find out how well it's doing with um, uh, the Brazilian one. But um, I, I can't foresee us keeping our borders closed to travel once we get vaccinated. And this is why we all have to rush out there and help because at the current rate, it's going to take us 80 more weeks. That's over a year. But is what I heard you saying then, just so to check I understand that when we talk about herd immunity, we're all in different herds. Exactly. So the herd immunity in Australia may not protect us from the herd in the United Kingdom. <laughs> That's right, because herd immunity, I mean, Rob will um, it, it eats and breathes herd immunity all the time. Um, but um, herd immunity is a factor of the R, how, you know, how big is the problem at the time, you know, the, uh, uh, how transmissible is it? Uh, also the vaccine efficacy. Uh, but there'll always be about a third of people. And then, of course, there's those who won't ever get it for many reasons. And there's about a third of each population that will be um, potentially at risk of acquiring it. But it might be more because the UK actually take up vaccines very well. They're like Australians. So the Europeans don't. So um, they may not ever reach herd immunity in, uh, in Europe. Now, in Israel, 120 people per 100 have had uh, um, two shots, which basically means they still need more people to get that second shot to get to 200, because um, uh, you need two shots to be 200% you know, covered. Um, so it depends where you're going. Um, but I can't see a time where we won't be allowed to travel. It, they will have to say, all right, we've done our best. We've protected you. We've protected you through the second wave um, and you've responded really well. It's up to you now. Uh, but it would be really nice if we started to use more science and identified for each other whether or not we have um, uh, antibodies. And so, uh, you know, some of these uh, travelers, these carriers like 
you know, the common ones, I won't mention any names that we catch, uh, may also be offering uh, in the price of a ticket, uh, the rapid antigen test, but also the antibody test. Yep, I've got my antibodies. I'm doing great. I can hop over and see my relatives in Israel or my relatives in England or wherever they are. Uh, and you've got a really good a sense of protection, um, except with AstraZeneca. I'm not so sure I'd go to South Africa yet. Um, not doing so well until we have a booster shop to cover that one. Well, thank you so much. Um, I might come to another question if that's okay, Rob. Uh, Alan, another question, please. Uh, I think the big one is why, and, and, and um, Julie did talk about that previously, the cutoff of 50 years age, and that's causing some concern by many of our questionnaires here, and we've had said, well over 200 people listening and being online, is um, do you think that's reasonable? And, and again, we talk about they should go and see their GP to confirm that, but of course, up until just more recently, it was only the 70 plus and then the the uh, people who were in the front line. So now we've gone to the fifties onwards uh, with AstraZeneca. So do you feel that that's a reasonable thing to do as it caused more confusion maybe there in the hesitancy? Um, Rob, do you want to comment? Yeah, yes. Um, well, in terms of the 50, why 50 years, um, why the cutoff there? Um, it's, well, first of all, it's using an abundance of caution in, uh, assessing the evidence. Um, so your risk of clotting um, goes down with age. Uh, um, yeah, and, and your risk of um, <coughs> serious complications from uh, COVID infection goes up with age. Um, sorry, the other serious complications go risk goes up with age and your risk of clotting goes down with age. So um, it, it's an assessment of benefit risk ratio and there's no magic cutoff there. It, it, it's just a, a, a judgment. Um, and so uh, I think people can confidently follow the, the recommendations, but at any age that the risk of um, of clotting is very low at any any age and in, in other countries. Not all countries apply that age restriction to AstraZeneca vaccine either. And Mary Louise, would you expect to go have access below 50 shortly? I, I, can I say at my local GP practice in the eastern suburbs, I asked the uh, GP who was getting his nurse to pop the needle in and I said, you got any vaccine hesitancy? He said, no, I've got all the people under 50 screaming for the vaccine. Like, so, when, so when will we let the under 50s have access? Well, uh, the under 50s will get Pfizer. And um, I imagine that until all of the um, quarantine and healthcare workers frontline have received their Pfizer, uh, they, they, it won't be rolled out to the general um, under 50s. And at the moment, I, ha I don't know if Rob's heard, but I haven't heard of any... Um, uh, uh, um, product coming into the country yet. Rob, have you heard? Um, any other, sorry, uh, other vaccines? Uh, no, just the Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer. Have you heard of, of uh, any deliveries so far? Uh, any extra deliveries? No, no, I haven't. Um, so, yeah, I'm just, uh, I agree, um, Mary Lou, that, um, that the Pfizer vaccine we have will, will have to be used for healthcare workers and, mm. and other people first before uh, extending to the general community. Thank you. Alan, uh, uh, we've, got, we've got time for one or two more questions. Yes, look, uh, the concern amongst a number of GPs was that 25% of the patients have decided not to be immunised. And one of our questions was, uh, do we believe, do we believe on this panel and yourself that everybody should be vaccinated? Um, I certainly, over 70, I've been vaccinated. I have my first um, injection and lining up for the second soon. So I think that there's a lot of hesitancy out there because of misinformation. And again, perhaps comments, you're talking about WHO and others, therefore the non 
European <coughs> English background people, therefore the cold population uh, of our country, the multi multicultural aspect, um, are we leaving them out here? Are we creating more confusion by we, uh, you know, specialists being still confused in a way? That's the question. Are we causing too much confusion mm -hmm. for those uh, different communities? Well, I, th I think um, people, well, we need to realise that, you know, this is a got um, unprecedented uh, times. We're living in unprecedented times. Sorry, sorry, I had, had to say that. Um, and the evidence is coming in daily. Uh, and uh, so we have to understand that um, messages are going to change slightly uh, according to that. Um, and but, you know, if we take a step back and realise what an incredible job has been done uh, to to have so many millions of doses of vaccine around the world um, a, a little over 12 months be, uh, after a completely new disease appeared it's it's amazing <laughs> so um, you know let, let's uh, let's look on the on the bright side Mary Louise, nice. your thoughts on, on the most at risk demographics and yeah. there has been media coverage suggesting both women mm -hmm. and multicultural communities are more likely to hes have hesitancy. Yeah. So um, a, a number of months ago, we were um, presented with um, evidence of uptake in um, Israel. The uptake was uh, a remarkable for many reasons, but one of the issues that uh, stood out to me was the higher the socioeconomic level, the higher the uptake, which then said to me the low socioeconomic groups are um, either neglected or feel neglected and feel unloved, to put it simply. So if you're working hard and trying to make ends meet and have several jobs to put food on the table and pay your rent, it doesn't matter which country you live in, you're less likely to feel thoroughly engaged into the into the wider tribe. And um, and and therefore, uh, it wouldn't be surprising that the same observations that we have uh, in Israel, we will have the same observations here. And um, I put it to um, the government here that it's up to them to become very, very innovative about how to get our low socioeconomic groups. And that innovation needs to include things like actually taking, like they do in a hospital, your cart to the staff to get vaccinated. They're so busy. Take the vaccine to Centrelink. Take the vaccine to the um, to the to the groups where new migrants live. I mean, um, I started life in Bondi, uh, and all post-war people lived there in highly densely populated apartments. There were three kids. I was a family of three kids, and we all lived in one room. So it's easy to find you when you're a, when you're an early migrant. You live together with the tribe. Uh, be it a Muslim tribe or Jewish tribe or uh, you know, South African or whatever it is, you go there and you work with the leaders and you, um, uh, so that they can hear because they're often so busy working that they don't actually hear the, the message. They don't watch the ABC or, or any, or they don't read the, the newspapers. They're too busy just surviving. I might, I might just add, uh, Sorry, if I could. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, some um, Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities, um, it, it, one uh, potential uh, area that people might think at at risk as far as access to health services. But my understanding uh, is that um, that's not <coughs> happening with with COVID, and it really really excellent example was set uh, in, in the last pandemic in 2009, um, where those communities were prioritised for it's one of the first groups to roll out the vaccine. And so uh, governments have been um, uh, very good in involving um, community controlled health services 
um, and and peak bodies right from the beginning. And my understanding is that um, the 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 vaccine rollout is is um, is working uh, quite well in Aboriginal communities. Uh, my understanding, yeah. I've been doing a bit of work in that area, Mary Louise. You'll correct me if I'm wrong. Is that that, that many of the Aboriginal controlled health organisations feel like they've shown initiative and leadership uh, in order to protect their people, that they moved quickly because they knew they're at risk. Yeah, they've yes. done a great job. Yeah, I, I concur with Rob and and you, Julie. They've done a, a most remarkable job. And, um, uh, you know, our, our new migrant groups, um, you know, are, are very new at... Uh, at being here, and they're often overwhelmed, um, and so they're the groups often that we neglect. We like to think we're a multicultural community, uh, but when we're a bit busy fighting a pandemic, uh, we tend to have forgotten them a bit. So I think now with the vaccine rollout, we really need to um, show that we care and uh, and focus on them as well. Well, look, Alan. In, in June... So you go, you go, Rob. Sorry. Um, well, in general, Australia has a very good record in um, rolling out um, mass vaccination programs and, and, and immunisation programs in general. Um, and uh, inequities that inequities exist, um, but uh, in general, we're pretty good at, at, at uh, achieving very high coverage. At the moment, the biggest uh, limitation seems to be vaccine supply rather than uh, people's hesitancy or, or lack of access. Um, and uh, as far as particular, if there are particular communities that might be less trusting of, of government, et cetera, um, local public health um, authorities are, are pretty good at, at liaising with those communities and, and with community leaders. Um, but I think at, at the moment, we, we just don't know if there are any, uh, what any um, uh, uh, groups that might be missing out. Um, the data are not in yet. Yeah. Uh, so the Ellen, one thing, I, oh. So you go, you go Mary Louise, Sorry, I just I want to say, just... Ellen, you go Mary. I was just going to say to Rob that the one problem I have is is that not everybody has a GP and this needs two um, doses. So we're pretty good at rolling out 14, I think it was 14 million flu doses, um, but that's a one-off jab. Uh, and also it probably didn't cover those that didn't have a GP. Um, in the old days, I don't, it's been a long time since I've had children, but you could get your children vaccinated um, in a special um, uh, a clinic for kids. Um, so we need to de-medicalize the vaccine rollout as well. I know that there are um, plans to include a pharmacy as well, uh, because that sort of thing does help for those that aren't, that don't have a GP, that, that aren't part of a community that uh, move around um, or, or just haven't got themselves a GP yet. Look, ladies and gentlemen, I think our time is up, Alan, unless there's one more urgent point, but I feel a, a psychological closure has arrived. And uh, I might hand back to Dr. Alan Shell uh, to close proceedings. And I'd just like to say I'm, my arm is slightly sore, but I'm glad my vaccine is in and uh, I've learned a great deal. So thank you just personally, but over to you, Alan. Well, thank you very much to Mary Louise, to Julie, to Rob Menzies and to Julie McCrossan. And many of your questions were answered without me having to ask them. So I think that's uh, quite valid that uh, our expert panel has answered a lot of the questions. And then thank you also for answering them offline. I appreciate that. Uh, we do uh, have post webinar email, which will give you some of the information, in particular the one about the information from Matagi and also from health.gov.au, which is the government's resource uh, website. And uh, we also asked that if you can, and there have been plenty of people there tonight to uh, feed, give us some feedback on our survey. Uh, just to know that uh, Walker and I also work with Holdsworth Community Group, where all our staff uh, manage COVID safe uh, procedures, and uh, most of them are getting vaccinated as we speak. And I think that uh, from surveys done uh, at ANU and by GPs, you'd have to say the vast majority, that is over 50% of people will get vaccinated, much the same as the vast majority of children in Australia have been vaccinated very well over the last 60 years. 
So I can only say that it's been a very topical topic this evening and that um, I'd say we'd like to conclude this evening uh, and thank again our panellists and to Julie and to remember that we will have the next one on in fact exercise and diet in him managing or improving certainly your health outcomes that'll be happening in July so please look out for the flyer and for your email so thank you wish you all to stay safe please get vaccinated and discuss with your GP if there are concerns um, particularly around stroke and clotting obviously so thank and you Alan, could I just quickly say we all wish Mary Louise well and we hope she gets yes. well soon and we thank her for coming on with such a sore throat that was very nice of you. absolutely thank you and we as we always say we we hand clap uh, to the people who can't hear us properly. So thank you and wish everybody stay safe, stay well, and please consider being vaccinated. Thank you and good night from Walpole.